and life load, I'll be also staying with the same uh, model and continue on the portion. The key points, um, I kind of covered them briefly too, are DXF import for defining three different parts and construction state, defining construction stage, how to set up, um, if you have used civil, you're probably familiar with these terms, structure, boundary, and load groups manually, and how to assign them to each stage to simulate the actual staging that's happening for you. I had a couple of feedback that um, you're having difficult time hearing, uh, not hearing anything. Um, can anyone provide a feedback if you hear well or not right now? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay. And um, also connecting to the staging definition, how to define concrete time dependency for the compressive strength, shrink and shrink and shrinkage, creep and shrinkage. And pre-stressing in connection to staging two, and how to do approximate loss calculation as per ASHTO, and moving load, um, setting up the lane, vehicle, moving load um, case, and so on. For the moving load portion though, I plan to have another session that kind of covers it in depth. So today we'll be more like um, going over setting up and reviewing the result. And everything that I'll be going over today, you can actually find, you can actually find a detailed tutorial. I'm going to upload them all on our um, Midas website and send it to everyone who attend and even for the ones that just registered too. So moving on to, uh, prior to moving on to the manual portion, I'll quickly go over what are the um, different type of wizards um, for segmental structures. So for example, as you can see, when you come to the um, structure main menu, you can find different type of segmental wizards, incremental launching method, construction um, type, um, free cantilever method, um, and movable scaffolding system, and full shoring method, and so on. So for any type of segmental staging, you can actually find the wizard. And for those who are not familiar with our uh, material database, not only on our website, but also when you go to our, uh, when you go to your, once you install the program, go to program files and go to Midas folder and go to Midas civil folder, you're going to find two important um, parts tutorial and manual and once you go into uh, in the tutorial folder you can find all different type of example models and um, these uh, wizard um, that I just mentioned you can actually find example um, models within your um, program files frequent deliver incremental launching method so for different type of wizard you can actually find a specific tutorial for it and that's the model, those are the model file, and you can go to the manual folder, go to the tutorials, and find actually a step-by-step -step thorough tutorial manual in this folder. And when you actually open them, um, these, are, um, these are actually really thorough. <laughs> it can be very lengthy too, depending on what type of, um, how you follow, you know. If you are more of a person who just uh, kind of take out what you need exactly and move on, this may be a very lengthy and detailed um, tutorial. But basically, every detail you can find on this default um, tutorial manuals. So um, I'll, I was going to cover the wizard a little more, but I will cover the manual portion more happily today. Okay, coming back to our um, the manual approach, um, as mentioned briefly in the beginning, I'm going to cover I'm going to cover um, this first portion, 
defining a section with three different parts. So how I'm going to do, I'm going to use my DXF file that I actually drew in AutoCAD program, but you can actually um, draw in MicroStation too. As long as you save it in DXF format, you can bring it into Midas Civil. Um, and I am going to um, go over some of the um, important um, things that you have to be cautious about, such as unit setting or tolerance setting. Um, one of the most frequently um, asked questions by our users is whenever they try to import CAD into Midas Civil, um, you know, settings such as units or tolerance, um, it's difficult for them to determine which way to go. So I'll try to focus on those parts. Um, and also highlight some of the um, some of the other parts that you have to pay attention to when using the um, CAD program <clears throat> and generating composite sections with three different parts or two parts and importing them to Midas Civil and modeling a simple straight line girder model so that I can show you construction stage and the analysis result in very simple manners. So this is an overview of um, the three-part section that I'm going to model. Uh, I'm just, for this portion, the first session, I'm only going to model just a straight line garter, but you can take a look at uh, what are the overview um, information about the section, where I'm getting this information based on. So basically, it's a two-top um, garter um, um, structure. And for the negative support section, uh, it actually has a plate. For the non-support regions, it doesn't have a plate. We pour the concrete straight um, onto the false work, but this is how it's done for the support regions. And this is what I'm going to um, show um, shortly using the CAD and um, as section property calculator tool in Civil. And the staging that I'm going to demonstrate will be in this order. Part one, just the top guarded portion will be activated. In part two, the plate cover will be placed on. And in part three, I'm going to show how you can um, actually activate the deck portion, making all this fully composite. And then we'll go over the analysis output. You can actually go over the analysis output about each stage. So stage three and about part one and part um, four total for the composite, all three portions. And you can actually review parts by parts. And also over here, you notice um, that I'm actually reviewing for the final stage. But you can actually change which stage you want to review about and review for non-composite state and so on. OK. So in this CAD program, I just drew uh, one single section. As you can tell, it's the right side girder um, based on um, the drawing um, cross-section view that we reviewed. Um, as you can tell, it's made of one, two, three portions. This is just a dimension line, so don't, don't mind it. And a couple things to um, uh, note when you um, try to import CAT to Civil is that um, they first need to be, if you actually drill with connected line, you actually need to explode all your lines first. So prior to importing them, just make sure that you explore, explode them. And also a couple other things, a circle or arc cannot be imported directly to civil. So if you are trying to import a curved line, you have to break them down into a um, um, group of segments of straight lines. And also spline cannot be um, imported into the civil. And the reason behind it is because um, FEA program runs with the basis of just a node and beam element or plate element or solid element. Spline or circle and arc are the concepts that are not existing in FEA program. So that's why um, that's, there goes a little bit of background um, for the limitations. The reason why arc, spline, those type of nonlinear um, CAD elements cannot be imported into civil is because FEA program don't really have such element as its basis. FEA element runs based on node, beam element, which is straight, 
and also plate or solid element. And none of them are actually um, equivalent to circles, arcs, or splines. So regardless, you have CAD program or microstation program, save them as a DXF format. So regardless what you have, as long as you save it into DXF format, I know MicroStation is more of a common CAD tool for our bridge engineers, but don't worry, as long as you save it into DXF, it's all good to go. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to open a brand new file in Civil. And here, before we, uh, before we directly import it to Mida Civil, there's one more step to go through. It's called um, Section Property Calculator, right here. So you can find this tool under um, the Tool Main menu. And then among all many of the generator functions, you can actually spot the Section Property Calculator. OK. And make sure to set the unit. Unit, I mean, the weight wouldn't matter because the CAD um, information don't have the weight with it, but the length will be um, very important. Make sure it is actually aligned with what you defined um, in the CAD program. And most likely, 99% um, of the time is going to be inch for um, um, our US engineers and millimeters for the Canadian um, engineers or any other area that are using um, SI units. Okay, and tolerance, this is also a factor that can really affect your um, importing. So right now, my section is quite, um, it's not very sophisticated. It's just a bunch of lines. You can tell um, the dimension of the smallest line is, you know, it's still a few inches. So having tolerance as one wouldn't really matter, but if your drawing is very sophisticated, if it's a very detailed um, like, um, connection member, uh, you have to consider uh, reducing the tolerance number. It's not always, I can't really say a standard, but then let's say when you import something and the drawing doesn't look right, and you know your cat, um, bait, cat, cat drawing is quite sophisticated, you have to, um, tolerance is something you can pay your attention to. So I set my tolerance as one as a general, and I go to import, and then I'm going to find AutoCAD DXF. Here I can easily spot my DXF file. I'm going to import the right section first. And this is to um, say if you want to offset it um, from the, um, the origin point as you import it and check on the active, the imported only, and say OK. And once you import it, it's going to ask you once again if you, um, if you want to check the intersection and or duplication of the imported DXF model data. Say yes. Be it, um, the purpose of this one is because in case there's any duplicate lines from the CAD, um, it's to make sure all of them are disconnected and the duplicate members are um, um, gotten rid of. So those little steps that I just highlighted on, they are something that can really affect your CAD drawing input, um, import. So if you're having any difficulty importing something and encounter any issue, um, pay attention to your unit setting when you um, open the section property calculator tool and also the tolerance and also exploring them back in the CAD program. And also over here, when you come here, make sure that you um, disconnect them at the interaction and also the erase duplicate member just by saying OK to initial question the program asks you. OK, once you're in this program, um, as you can notice, I have three sections. Um, it doesn't mean that you can draw a like one single section, you know, simple section. You can do that too. And also you can do a simple, just two part composite too. So basically here you can first, and also not to forget, you can draw, you can start from scratch um, in the section property calculator tool. But even my, um, if my preferred way is to import the CAD. <laughs> so I believe that may be the case for a majority of um, our attendees today too. 
So you can actually go to uh, material first. Define the material first. My garter portion will be defined as C9000 concrete. Okay. Then I'm going to define my second material. which is C4500. Okay. Uh, the reason why we define the section here, I mean material here, if it's a single um, part section, you don't need the material. It wouldn't affect it. But since it's multi-parts, and different, um, they may have different material. In case they um, different parts have different material, you need to specify the material so that the program can actually consider um, the effect of the material um, difference uh, when calculating the section property. Now, if you have a single section, you can go to section and generate, and simply choose um, those parts, give it a name, and apply. However. We are actually working with a composite type of section. So I'm going to go to composite section tab here and find the same function generate, but for composite section. Okay. Um, name garter. Um, it's going to be part one. And let me select. the garter lines. Press control key to select multiple at once. Okay. Oh, total three parts. Okay. And apply yes. And then going to section. I'm going to first I generated I actually let the program know um, this is a section that's made of three parts. And then you can go to the section and add parts to them now. Part one, quarter, part name. Select the lines for just the girder this time and apply. And this time, select the parts for um, the cover plate. Give it the second part. Provide a name. Define the material for it. Apply. Say part three, that portion, and also apply here. Yes. So this way you can make three different parts, um, um, specifying the material that you have. And once you do, you can actually export it. Um, before, uh, one more step. So give it the material first, define the section, add parts to them, and come to the property and calculate the composite um, property. Mesh size, I'm just going to go with one. But again, right now, my section isn't very sophisticated. But if it's, um, if it's, the, um, if it's a case, um, if your case, um, your section has like um, very like an arched portion, like a curved, um, like um, let's say between the web and flange, you have you have to reflect the curve between them. In that case, the mesh size may need to be reduced. Um, it's actually going to indicate in the error um, the message window that the mesh is too coarse. That it needs to be um, the mesh size needs to be reduced. So 
So now I'm ready to export this data. Uh, going to name that as three part garter. Okay. So once you define it, you can come back to Midas Civil, go to um, properties main menu where you can define um, material section and other related um, properties, and add a section over here. And depending on what type of section you're importing from um, the drawing you have to go to um, specific portion to it. If it's a just a regular um, section, you can go to a general section for a single you know, part section. If it's a pre-stressed concrete section, like a um, unique box section for your state, let's say, although you can find a lot of them in our database, you can actually go to, uh, you can actually go to um, PSC value here and you can also import from your own section property calculator. The part that we have right now is a composite type of section um, made of three parts, and it's going. It's actually um, it's actually a general type. It's not either T, PSC, or steel I or top. So I select composite general where I can import the section property calculator file. Press import SCC file. Uh, one second, let me organize better. Yes. Find the location of the file once again. Okay, and three part garter appears here as we defined them, exported before, and say open. Okay. Do you notice how um, this window has changed from nothing to um, this data that we created before? So this is how you can um, define an arbitrary section. Um, based on my um, demonstration, I believe you can actually catch um, how to use the, uh, use the section property calculator tool um, um, for a single part section or multi part section. It's the quarter number two. Yes. And when you actually, um, and here you can specify for more than three port, more than two portions. I mean, for two part section, it's obvious that uh, what is the before composite section? Before, like three part sections, it's not as clear what is the before composite section. So it's going to ask you if part one is um, by itself is the composite before composite section, or part one and part two uh, combined is the um, before composite section. So you can um, you can manipulate those parts too. And when you actually press on the show calculation results, it's going to show you different um, calculation results like this. Okay, so this is how you can define your section using a CAD program and also um, and section property calculator. Um, yes, um, um, first a few attendees, I do see your hand raised. Um, if you have any question, please note it to um, the question box. I'll check the question box um, from time to time. Uh, maybe um, if it doesn't go with the flow of the training very well, I may answer them later, but I'll try to cover them and make it relevant um, to your question um, as I see them come in. Okay, so what I'm going to do from now on, I'm going to quickly set up a straight line garter model um, so that I can show how to, um, um, so that I can help understanding how to use um, construction stage um, function in Midas Civil. I'm going to define two materials real quick, uh, one, for, uh, one for the garter portion and the other one for uh, the, the, the deck portion. Garter uh, C9000, um, C9000 concrete was for uh, the garter portion. 
and 4500 was for um, the deck portion. So I defined them in ASTM RC uh, material database. Uh, the reason why I defined my material before already, right? But I'm defining them once again. And for the reason for defining them twice is because um, the materials that I manually input in the section property calculator, it was simply for calculating the section property, section um, um, properties. And the reason why I input the material um, in Midas Civil again is because this material is something that the program is actually going to use for considering, um, for calculating the self weight and also the, the basic material. So this isn't related to calculating um, different parts to the section. This is, um, this is the actual base uh, material that you will need to define. I have a question come in regarding the unit setting. So in the section property calculator, uh, when you define uh, um, when you define the uh, material, yes, right, correct. The unit wouldn't show over here, but the thing is, uh, so you have to make sure which unit setting has been picked when you first open the program, or when you you can actually go to setting and check it. Um, section property calculator interface is a little less sophisticated than the Basic Mida Civil. But basically, you can come to Tools and Setting and check the unit. But as um, you're right, um, the unit will not be showing when you define them like this. But it's going to show when you define within Midas Civil. OK. Now I'm going to define a straight line real quick. I'm going to uh, model. Uh, Hundred and um, hundred and twenty feet uh, long uh, line garter. It's going to be a straight one. So first, I create uh, the beginning node and determine how many times I want to copy it, and determine the distance gap between the copied nodes. So twelve, I copy them twelve times, um, and at ten feet apart, I'm actually modeling total ten. Uh, Total 10, I mean um, 13 uh, nodes like this. And you can go to um, the shortcut key here and um, turn on the node number. All these little details, um, turning on the node number or changing the unit, are more of a details. Um, since this is a more of an intermediate um, um, level class, uh, those are you can actually refer to um, detail step-by-step -step tutorial material. But for today, during the session, let's try to focus on um, getting um, the core parts for the post-tension application. And then I come to Node an Element, Create Element, and um, select the material and section. Uh, when you select the material for the composite section, I define two materials, grade C9000 and C4500. But when I actually model them, I'm going to, when you model your um, um, beam elements, you can only assign one material property. One beam element cannot have two different material property, right? Uh, when, uh, so you're going to specify grade C9000 um, as the main, the base material, which is the garden material, and pick the section, and then um, click on the nodal connectivity, and draw a line like this. So this way, when I turn off the hidden view, it's a simple line. When I turn on the hidden view, you can see the section property, um, section dimension like this. OK. I'm going to define my boundary too. Uh, coming to the boundary main menu, define support real quick. OK, actually. OK, and then I'm going to define, I'm just going to define self-weight for, um, for this example. All 
Okay. So I define my self-weight load case. And also I define my self-weight by defining the factor to the gravitation. So self-weight um, is calculated automatically using the section and material property in Mida Civil. So we have the basic materials ready to set up the construction stage. Um, this is actually um, the key portion for understanding um, the construction stage. So basically, when you define the construction stage, you have to go to the load main menu, find the construction stage load type, and click on define CS. And when you click on add, you can actually define multiple stages. Stage um, non-composite. Duration will be um, just about, let's say, seven, um, seven days. And then um, we don't have any um, groups yet, but let's define um, the stages first. And then um, composite, uh, I mean um, plate. Covered, and then full composite. So I define three stages, one non-composite, plate covered, and full composite. And here what we need to do is we have to go to the group, group tab, and then um, specify the structure group, boundary group, and load group. When you click on define um, construction stage, Notice that we, we need to have a bunch of groups, element group, boundary group, and load group. And notice structure group, boundary group, and load group. And structure group right here is actually the same thing as um, the element group here. Just a terminology switch. Coming to the structure group, so basically, um, one second, let me go back once again. So basically, how the construction stage works in Midas, if you, uh, um, for today's PT, you know, it's a post-tension box quarter um, training. So I believe a uh, majority of our clients um, do have an experience with FEA program. So basically, it's similar, but you need to actually provide a group for the node and element and group of support, spring, elastic link, those type of boundary um, component, and also um, groups for the loadings. And how you, um, how you actually bring different part into different stage, it's a matter of activating different group in, uh, in the proper stage that you want um, in order to simulate it. Okay, so I'm going to make one structure group, girder line one. So, and then for this case, I'm going to um, select every element and assign the structure group by just dragging and dropping. And same goes for the boundary. Simply, it's just a support boundary. So I'm going to drag and drop too. And then for the boundary, since there are multiple type of boundary things, it's going to ask you how you want to, uh, which component do you want to include into this boundary group. Um, but basically, if you didn't know that you can actually um, use the drag and drop feature to assign different group, here you go. And also for the loading group, self-weight. And for this loading, I have to go back to the load. Um, I have a second tree menu open. You can do that by right-clicking here on the toolbar and click on the tree menu number two. And also, when you go to the tools, you can customize by opening the second tree menu like this. Coming to the group, uh, I mean the work tree. So here, I'm going to go into the properties. So basically, you can see a summary of all the data in the work tree. Uh, this function dialog box opens up. Um, by default on the left side. And right now the load group is default. So I'm going to change it to the self weight and modify. Okay. So quarter line one, support and the self weight. And how do you check later on if the things are assigned to the right um, group, right? So let's say for the support, we, don't, we want to make sure that my supports are assigned to the support group. 
then you can go to the work street, find, find the boundaries and find the support, right click and get to the tables. Then at the end of the table, you can see the group column. And it's going to tell you which boundary group these two um, um, spring, I mean supports belong to. Okay. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to um, assign them into the first stage. Garden line. Um, so non-composite in the first stage, stage one, non-composite. The garden line will be activated. Yes. <clears throat> And again, for the boundary, support will be activated at the same time. And the loading self-weight will be initiated the first time too. Okay, so what happens now when you, uh, with the um, construction stage window, when you actually go through each stage, you're going to see in the non-component state, all of the element, boundary group, and load is activated. And nothing has been added to the plate covered and full composite. So there's no change um, into in different stage. But this is what not what we want, right? We actually need to separate these parts. In order to do that, you can go to the load, stay in the construction stage load type, and find composite section for CS. Click on composite section for CS. And what the purpose of this function is to separate the parts, um, like the composite parts. So this composite um, parts, three different parts, it's assigned to um, individual beams as a single section property. So in order to separate it, um, so usually what you have to do is you have to model the deck as a separate beam member or plate member, but in Midas you can model them all together. But you can actually separate them using the construction composite section for construction stage. Add um, and then active stage will be non-composite since that's when the girder is activated. And for a section, I'm going to choose three part girder number two, which is the section that I want to, you know, like deal about. And it's going to be a user defined type of section or general, wouldn't really matter. And for part one, the material type can be either element or material, and you can pick the garden material. And uh, let me cover, let me come back what is the material and element once again, but give me one second. Let me first choose the material for different parts. So this part one, two, three is referring to garter, cover plate, and the deck portion one by one. And the material type, uh, again, remember, in an FEA program, only one single material can be assigned to, a sing um, to individual beams. There's no such thing that you can define, assign two different materials to a single beam, right, element. So in order to reflect um, different parts, what we do is we actually bring this function so that we can actually um, apply different material um, for different parts not as um, the element, but using our um, composite section type. So part two has different material. It's got C4500 um, concrete. So for the part one, I have C9000 concrete. And part two and three, I have 4500, right? And what I meant by, you can, uh, for the girder, the, uh, which, is, which has the base material, uh, you can actually pick element. And what this means is that uh, remember, we assigned the girder material um, to these individual beams. We didn't assign 4500. We actually assigned C9000 as the material for this element. And when you choose element as the material type, it's going to bring that material by default as the material property for the part one. So that's the difference between the material and the element. It's for your convenience to kind of leave the material as the element and stay with what you define um, at, on the basic, um, the global uh, model. Composite stage. Um, so this is where you specify uh, at which stage you want different parts to be activated at. So part one, the girder, we want to activate it in non-composite, right? Which is already our active stage. 
active stage, non-composite here. Pay attention to active stage, the same terminology. It means that um, this girder part one will be activated and the active stage chosen as the basis. Part two will be activated in the plate covered stage, the second stage I defined. And part three will be activated in the full composite section that I defined. Okay, so this portion right here is to let the program know at which different stage you want to activate different portions. And in age, so age is related to um, age is related to um, the time dependent um, property. So basically, uh, I will come back to this part shortly um, in a little bit. But just uh, notice that this is for um, in connection to the time dependent um, property of the material. For this simple example, for the first part, I'm not going to use the time dependent material, so I'm going to skip the age. H is actually related to the creep and shrinkage calculation. I'll come back to this portion too. Uh, one second. So I wasn't able to register the data. And the error message is telling me, I hope you can see it. I hope you can see. <laughs> so basically, it was telling me that I'm currently in a construction stage, and this information cannot be defined in uh, a construction stage. It needs to be defined in base stage only, was what I, what I was trying to say. So go back to base. Let me real quick define that composite section data. Okay, so now when you review your non-composite state, it's not going to be the same anymore. Before, it was like this for all three stages, but now it's actually separated into non-composite, plate covered, and full composite. And let's run the analysis. Okay. You can go to the result, find, let's say, uh, displacement, and choose different stage, and see uh, different stage um, output. Non-composite, right now we are looking at the deformed shape. Don't be overwhelmed with the deformed shape. It's actually scaled, so if you want, you can review the real displacement with the scale off. And plate covered, and full composite. So that was about how to distinguish uh, multiple um, sections. Moving on to the second portion. Okay. Moving on to the section um, por second portion, tendon and construction stage. And I had a question saying, um, can um, is the can the error message be displayed um, before you say okay? Unfortunately, um, um, it's not going to let you know prior to saying OK. OK. And as one of the um, questions was raised, it's correct. H is only for CBFIP. Right. So when you use the um, ASHTO, it's, not, it's going to be a little different. Let me uh, mention that part in a little bit in this um, second portion. Tendon and construction stage, um, geometric generation from um, DXF or um, section assignment, uh, boundary, tendon layout, and setting up the construction stage, and construction stage analysis and results. 
So uh, um, for the cross section, we already reviewed the cross section, but this is an overview of the structure. And this is uh, how the tendons will be um, um, uh, located. It's a spliced um, structure, as you can see. Uh, staging will be in uh, four different uh, bases. Temporary support first, then the girders, and, and then um, um, pre-stressing. Construction stage, as you can see, this will be how it's going to be composed. Uh, uh, we have detailed training material. So what I'm, I mean, step-by-step -step tutorial manual. So for the time, um, for the time being, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to have a fully model model open and actually go over each aspect one by one. So that way we can get into more detail um, for uh, with the time given. So basically for in the stage one, the girders are activated and um, the abutment portion has a link and um, um, and the beam and release is applied as a, for the temporary support at the temporary support. For the loading, just the self-weight is activated. In the stage two, um, the lead on uh, the cover plate for the support region is activated. And in stage three, uh, the post tensioning occurs. And in stage five, uh, the dummy deck is, um, so basically the deck portion is activated and the beam and release is applied at the temporary um, support. And uh, yep. Okay. Let me refresh my view one second. So this one, there will be two ways to uh, model this structure. One, you can actually, for the basic layout, you can actually use our node and element to create the node and rotate it. Again, you can refer to more detail in the step-by-step -step tutorial manual, which will be uploaded on our website and um, um, sent out to everyone here today. So things to go over is time-dependent material and the construction stage setup and the stressing. One by one, let's come to material and time-dependent material first. So when you come to the properties, uh, you're going to find the time-dependent material section. And here you can see the creep strength cage and compressive strength, um, um, the, the part that we are interested in. Here I already defined um, the, the uh, let me change my unit setting real quick. So this is the function for creep and shrink cage. You can go to creep shrink cage here and define neurally. Let's review what I have so far. So I use CVFIP as mentioned, and here you define the notational size of member. But you know, as you know, we have three different parts, and this will be different for each part. So that was the purpose of the H column in the construction stage four composite um, state. And as mentioned, as per H2, you input your um, um, volume surface ratio separately. So depending on which code you want to go with for defining your time dependency, it's going to change your input parameters. And also our CVFIP um, database will be updated um, shortly, uh, pretty soon, by before the end of August. Um, it's going to have um, CVFIP 2010 um, 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 edition. So basically based on these input parameters, it's going to the program will um, draw the function. You can also use your um, Jordan 2. And I also defined one for grade C4500. And when you come to the compressive strength, same goes. Depending on the code that you choose, 
you can actually um, specify, um, um, actually draw the graph like this. And volume surface ratio are not actually, um, it's, um, I'm answering one of the questions raised. Volume surface ratio, uh, ratio will not, not be updated automatically as you change your section. So time-dependent material um, is, um, so you can define them very easily. It kind of went too quick even, you know, because you can actually define them based on um, the function that's already embedded. And you can define them based on um, just the uh, um, simple input parameters the program asks you. You don't need to write out a, like a time-dependent function or anything. It's going to be there. So you can simply input the basic parameters and have the program verify the function for you. And if you need to, um, of course, if, um, validate those functions, you can check it with um, in the tabular format and also the graphical format. Once you are done defining your creep shrinkage and compressive strength, you need to link it to the materials that you have. So just because you defined a function for compressive strength or creep and shrinkage, it doesn't mean the program knows automatically which one's what, you know. It's something that um, the users need to uh, link. So we have to, after defining creep shrinkage and compressive strength, we just go through one more um, step to link um, each portion. Choose the one from the creep string cage, choose the proper compressive strength, and select the section, I mean the material, that you want to link this creep string cage compressive function, and say add and modify. Same goes for the second material, just change your function. Choose different material, say add and modify, right? Okay. So this is how you have the time-dependent function run. And how it's going to work, you know, simultaneously with the construction stage analysis setup. So because, you know, we define our function, but it's one function, how does the program know um, when is the girder activated and at what point of the time dependency is the function at, like what is going on, how are they working all together? So basically you assign a function to the material, right? So we have a, uh, we have, two different materials linked, grade C9000 and 4500, right? We have different type dependent functions. And when you go to define your construction stage, what you're going to see is the age here. So uh, right before that, just hold on to it for uh, just a little bit. Let's go over how the construction stage is um, formed for this structure. In stage one, um, same as before, um, the girders are activated, as you can see, and also what we saw in the PowerPoint. Stage two, the top plate is just put on for the support regions. And I forgot to mention this portion, but we have the temporary support like this at the splice locations. Um, plate is covered, and in stage three, uh, the temporary support is removed, and here some of the other, um, the pre-stress uh, loading is activated. And in stage 4, the deck is poured, and stage 5 is actually for considering the long-term creep and shrinkage. So the girder portion that has the grade C9000 material, it's already started in stage 1. And in stage two, the plate cover comes in. And in stage three, I mean four, the concrete is poured and hardened activated. Keep that in mind, come back to our input interface. Um, pay attention to stage one, construction stage one. And here, um, the girder group is activated in the first construction stage with age of seven. And in construction stage two, uh, plate cover comes in, but that's handled in the composite section, um, composite section for construction stage. And same goes for the rest. But basically, keep in mind, the girder is activated with age of 7, right? And when you come back to the loading and go to composite section for CS, find uh, the list of different composite section for construction stage defined. 
and pay attention to the age portion again. And here for age, oh, actually, um, actually, that age, um, um, uh, not the uh, not the volume surface ratio, but then H for CBFIP, uh, they can be automatically updated uh, when you change your section property. And I forgot this portion, but you can actually say um, use this function here, update all H. So if you don't want to update for each different section, you know you don't have you, you don't want to calculate for different section. We defined the section already, so why not have the program do it for us, right? So use this function to act, um, update all the age. And age right here, so this is relevant to the time dependency of the concrete once again. And each time dependency of the time de uh, of the concrete starts when that element is activated. So in the first stage, the girder is activated, meaning the first girder portion is activated with um, grade C9000 uh, uh, material, right? with age of seven. What this means is it's going to be activated with age of seven so that at the um, if you look at the compressive strength, it's going to have the strength at age of seven days. Same goes for the part two, age seven. So when this element, when the plate cover is activated, it has the strength at age of seven days. Same goes for the deck. And the reason why we don't really set it to zero, you know, in reality, we pour a concrete and it doesn't have any age, especially for the deck portion. But we still set the age to be, um, you need to give it some number such as 537, um, some small number. The reason for that is because um, it's actually a function how we can consider the compressive strength, right? So if you put the age as zero, what's going to happen is it's not going to be able to do the nonlinear computation here. It's going to get stuck in the zero um, infinite loop. So you have to give it certain age. So that way, the program has a certain um, strength value to pick up from and actually continues on with the rest of the function. So that's why giving it the age of, let's say, 1, 3, or even like 5 and 7, those uh, arbitrary number that uh, just to give the program certain number, to start with um, for the function, we provide an age. And also age, uh, not just for those purpose, but it's critical to reflect, let's say, freshly poured concrete cast in place or precasted uh, members. So that's how you can distinguish precast members and pour in cast members. So if the age is about 28, uh, that means uh, yes, correct. Um, so I had, I had a question asking what is what age is recommended to capture the effect of initial shrinkage? Actually, for shrinkage, uh, it wouldn't matter. Shrinkage, um, initial um, shrinkage. Actually, I'll get back to this portion. Before the compressive strength, um, you if you want to reflect the precast um, type, you can give it age of 28 letting the members start with the strength of at 28 days. If it's a cast in place, you want to give it some beginning um, day number, like 1, 3, 5, and so on. Just, just a number to give the program something to start with. So when in the first stage, the girder is activated. So this girder currently has, in the very beginning, has the strength at 7 days. And in stage two, um, in, as soon as the second stage starts, this plate cover also has the strength as seven days. So that's how the um, time dependence um, functions and the construction stage analysis uh, work um, simultaneously. And the last portion is uh, uh, the tendon property function. So uh, tendon definition is made into two different parts. One is for um, three, tendon property, tendon profile, and tendon pre-stress. When you come to the load main menu, come to the temperature pre-stress uh, loading type, and find the pre-stress loadings. Tendon property, profile, and tendon pre-stress. So tendon property basically is a, um, it's, you define literally the type of the tendon. 
Is it a post tension, pre tension, or external? Shoes. What type of material you're using? What is the total tendon area? You can also choose um, based on the strand diameter and also the number of the strands. What is the duct diameter? Relaxation coefficient. What is the code that you want to use for calculating the relaxation coefficient? And then rest up the input for calculating the loss stress. And basically, this is why uh, working with either pre-stress, I mean pre-tension or post-tension type is flexible. Combination of it or just one or the other, you just need to define the proper um, tendon property. And you can define multiple tendon property too. It's just a matter of which property you link um, um, different group of tendon profiles. So second portion is the tendon profile. Tendon profile uh, can be defined in manual way using, you know, this type of um, coordinates, but it's very, uh, um, you know, it's it's doable. <laughs> but if you do not want to do it this way, looking for a solution in which the program optimized it better, you can go to the structure, go to pre-stress concrete bridge, and find tendon template. And here, choose the group of element you want to uh, assign. Let me do that real quick. Oh, it needs to be the regular section. But basically, you can actually choose from different tendon type. So this way, you don't have to work with the, um, the coordinate number. All you need to do is simply define the distance from the top, bottom, and also the distance from the end to the curve point. And you can define it for spin by spin or for different spliced um, parts. Uh, you can actually define for the entire line depending on how you select those. So if you only select, let's say, one splice portion, you can define the girder um, tendon for that area. If you define all the element, you can actually define this hard curve, whatever the case be, uh, for the entire area too. So this is uh, maybe an easier way for you to um, deal with. You can also adjust how many spans you're going to have and so on. So this way, yes, um, it's easier to work with. So if you don't want to work with the coordinate number, there you go. And then the last portion is tendon um, pre-stress. So in this tendon pre-stress is where you define the number, the actual stress uh, number checking force. So, so we have all different uh, tendon profile, right? So choose the tendon profile and choose the, um, I mean, type in the stress um, tendon uh, stressing force, checking force. And then let the program know if you want to check it in um, the beginning end or the end end or both ends. You have you can choose either to um, input a stress or a force value. And then also you can define when you want to grout it, if it's an unbonded type, um, and edit. And when you define the tendon profile, uh, you actually have a choice to select the tendon property. So um, so remember I mentioned that there can you can define multiple tendon properties. If you're working with a post tension, you can define post tension. But if it's a post tension but different type, if the property isn't really the same, which may be the case often, you can define multiple tendon properties and just pick the proper tendon property when you define the tendon profile. So as mentioned before, it's not really a matter of is the program capable of doing one or the other. You can actually handle all of them uh, within one model and one um, program. And it's just a matter of linking which tendon property, post-tension, pre-tension, external, with the specific tendon profile you want to assign different property for. And then um, assigning when to stress it. And also, how do you know like when to stress, when to apply the stress and things like that? So when we define this um, tendon pre-stress load, you can also define the load group name. 
and group load group. Does this sound more familiar now? So basically, you assign each pre-stress into a load group. They don't have to be assigned to different um, individual groups. You can actually define them um, in different group um, depending on when you want to activate them. So remember, in when you compile when you uh, compose the construction stage in the loading tab. You can notice the uh, post-tension is actually put in in the third stage as um, uh, in order to make it um, in connection to um, the actual project phase, staging phase. So this load group post-tension is activated in the third stage. And let me go back to uh, the tendon profile portion. Let me cover them a little briefly. So, okay, I'll go over this interface. Um, so. You can specify the tendon name. Um, basically, before remember, you can actually choose the type, herb or curve um, in the um, in the structure main menu. When you do it, it's going to create this type of individual um, coordinate data. And also, you can from the scratch just define the data with the coordinate too. And here, tendon property, choose the tendon property and choose the assigned element. Um, this tendon line is assigned to the exterior girder. So how do I know? Um, it's, it has the assigned element to 216, 167 by 3. So let's say if I actually choose this element, it's going to be updated here. And then you can choose your input type to be either 2D or 3D. If you choose 2D, you're going to be um, defining X, Y first, and then Y and Z as the second. If you do 3D, you define all three X, Y, Z coordinate at the same time. And straight length of tendon, how long is it, um, goes for, um, and curve type, is it spline or round? This is to um, actually um, uh, for shaping this type of um, curves. I actually barely see a case where the round um, is a better type. And typical tendon, this can be um, pretty useful if you're working in a preliminary stage. So basically, if you don't want to define all your tendons you know, in the very beginning phase, what you can do is you can define one coordinate at the bottom of the girder or you can you know, define one more for the web portion and another one for the other side of the web. And what you can do is you can actually just increase the number of tendons. So with one typical profile, uh, just increase the number so that the program can actually consider five times of the effect of a single tendon. So that way, if you're not really set with your tendon um, data yet, you can actually do basic tests, you know, like approximate test with this typical tendon function. And the tendon length, uh, you can either use and define or have it auto calculated. And I mean the transfer length. And the profile, this is actually something really useful in our program. So uh, you can actually define your profile to be a straight line. So define the coordinate. And just have it straight, right? And just define which one is your insertion point. Profile insertion point right here. Second option is curve. So basically, you define um, about the curve that you want to draw. Define right over here the coordinate. So profile insertion point once again. Pick a point. And radius center, what is the center of the radius? Maybe somewhere here for this structure. And the offset too. Um, how much do you want to offset? And so, but then I hate both options. <laughs> what I like to go over and what a lot of our engineers, our user engineers actually conventionally use more often is the element type. So element basically, it runs based on the assigned element. So this coordinate value will be um, about the element that you select. So right now I select this exterior girder, right? So this is my reference line. 
if you choose straight, just the insertion point, that's your, that's your starting point, and then it goes by the um, coordinate. If you choose the circle two, you draw your, uh, you draw your insertion point in the center of the radius, and about that circle that's already defined over here, it kind of offsets using x, y, z number. Element, you just need to choose a group of element and define the offset locations. Yes, x is the longitudinal, z is literally the vertical, and y is the transverse, correct? Yes. And this is what really makes it easy for a curved, um, like a regular type of um, structure too. Uh, one minor difference between the curve and element is uh, when you actually draw the element, what happens is element itself is straight. As mentioned in the beginning, in FEA program, elements cannot be curved. That's not a proper type of uh, component in um, 3D FEA program. So every single element is straight. So when you actually have the reference axis as a um, element type, What's gonna what's gonna happen is these little components. It's going to draw the coordinate. Do you see little um? Do you see this orange line over here? Not the red line, but then the thin um orange line. So that's the tendon profile. As you can see, it's smooth and curved. But if you actually go into the reality, like the the bottom point, it's actually straight because the elements are straight too. So if you were to look for like um, differences between the curve type and the element type. Element, because it's about based on the elements, the tendon also is a, um, like, um, it's actually straight when you look into the bare, the base segment. When you do the curve though, it's actually drawing a curve line. So if it's very curve critical, curve may be more accurate, but based on my exper um, experiment and from, based on my clients on feedback too, um, any, anyone who used it in the past, Element and curve didn't really have much difference. But it's actually the same for the girder too. It's a curved structure, uh, and we modeled it uh, with, a combina with a group of um, straight beams. And the reason why we segment it like this, this is to reflect the curvature properly. So same goes for the tendon. Um, if you really need to be accurate, you can go for the curve. But from the cases, not much difference between curve and element. But that was the difference between the two. And this one is to um, here. This is to let the program know which point is the insertion point, the starting point. Is it the element over here or is it the element in the other end? The program wouldn't know unless you tell that number two. So that's what this is for. And if you want to copy, you can copy and move. For copying, you can actually choose, um, let's say you can copy in different way. You can actually um, copy with element increment. So, and also if you want to copy at equal distance, that works too if it's a uniform structure. If you want to, let's say, assign this tendon into this tendon, right? The inner one this time. You can actually choose different group too, but you know it's it, they don't have the same length. For that, we actually have an option to auto adjust um, the tendon length here. So this way, even if uh, even if the uh, the point isn't really the same, I mean, even if uh, the length isn't the same due to the curve or skew, whatever the case be, um, it's actually going to take that into the consideration and reduce the size or increase the length and so on. So I actually didn't input all this manually. I just create one and copy them through, just manipulating information little by little. But that's where the copy and move can be more useful. And also, uh, we we really pay attention to the CAD and um, the program um, communicability. So you can also export this to um, CAD DXF. Or the other way around, you can go to the tools, use the tendon generator, and actually, if you actually drew that in a CAD program, you can actually import the DXF and yeah, work with the, instead of working with the coordinate, you can define the profile uh, with the DXF file. Okay, 
So simultaneously pay attention to uh, the workstream menu. Let me shrink it. One second. Let me just open up uh, material. Not material. Um, tendon profile. And the support. Okay. And when we go over stage one more once once again, girder activated with the temporary support. And in stage two, the top plate is covered uh, with the compressive strength at age seven. Part three, it's actually pre-stressed like this. You notice the um, PT, the post-tension load is activated in the static load here. And in stage four, the deck portion is fully um, activated, meaning it has the full strength now. Stage 5. Stage 5 is just um, 10,000 days to consider the full sh shrinkage and creep effects. Okay. So when you review the result too, You can review uh, this, um, um, the result at each different stage. Let me actually draw deflection contour. Stage one. It's an exaggerated view. So when I turn on the real displacement, it's not as drastic. Two. You can review um, stage by stage. The last portion um, will be the staging. Um, not much of it anymore, but more on the live load portion. So for this one, I'm going to define two lanes running on top of each girder, but it doesn't mean that um, the um, live load can run in the middle. It can also run at any part of the bridge. But for this one, I'm going to define two lanes like this and just the design truck and uh, tendon truck. This portion uh, will be very short, and after that, we'll be moving on to um, Q&A session and closing. So moving load also, uh, more details about like um, um, different cases, you know, for flared or um, unique structure, uh, it will be covered um, in our moving load um, session. But today, for the moving load, it, you can actually define in three steps. Define your lane, vehicle, and moving load. And when you for this one, since this is a structure with um, um, beam element, I define line lanes. As mentioned before, I am going to define. I had defined two different lanes: lane one and lane two. So how is the um, lane working? So um, to give you the basics about our moving load, our moving load is based on um, influence line analysis. It's not based on the distribution factor um, analysis, but you can actually do a workaround to reflect that by defining a single line girder. Just take out a line, do a line girder analysis, and do the distribution, um, uh, calculate the distribution factor outside of program and input in the program. But for this type of complex structure, it's uh, it's not really um, the case. So. The basis for the moving load in MIDAS is influence analysis. And right now, you have to define the approximate location of the lane and define the vehicle loading and moving load. And also, according to me, uh, in order to meet the ASHTO, um, the dual truck rule about the negative moment at the support, you can define the lane support negative moment and lane support reaction. And um, actually, to um, provide a news for the update for the moving load, so our moving load history was first, what I told you up to now was what we had for quite a while. 
And as an improvement to our moving load, we actually added this portion, traffic lane optimization. What this is about is, um, let me take to uh, online help manual. You can open the same manual by pressing F1 key. So our uh, first improvement to our moving load analysis was to, uh, you can actually approximate the location of the lane and have the program floated at the middle and the end and the other ends. So that's what, how the, um, that's um, a little more detailed the moving load analysis covered right now. And so you can basically um, specify the lane width and let me change my unit to feet. Give me one second. So activated, change your lane to, let's say, 10. And then you define your wheel spacing. The reason I give it 10 is because in order to leave out the two feet um, at the end, um, to leave the two um, the end clearance, two feet end clearance. And this is how it, it is. You have to give it approximate location of the lane, moving loop. But our second improvement to the moving load analysis that will be um, that will be changed um, in December release. Um, it's going to be uh, you don't have to define the approximate location even. You just give the program um, the width of the um, the lane, the vehicle wheel spacing, and just give it um, the loading type. And the program will be actually doing um, just the all full um, floating in the transverse direction too. Currently, it does it for the longitudinal direction, but it's going to be doing that for the um, transverse direction. But that's the second improvement um, that will be joined um, um, in December. But this one, it goes the same. You choose your, um, you choose your, um, Basically, when you define your lane, give it a name. If you want to do approximation, just turn on this option, tell it the wheel spacing and the lane width, and the eccentricity is about how off you want to define it from the reference line you picked. And the reference line, you can pick it based on uh, this number, the element number. So lane width, wheel spacing, and traffic lane optimization will actually refine the location of the lane. And vehicular load distribution. Um, so in Midas, you can define the lane load distribution. So the lane element isn't really recommend, recommended unless it's a single box type of structure. You can also refer to more detail in the online help manual too. But basically... What's going to happen is if you choose the lane element, it's actually going to um, um, uh, run the, um, it's actually going to um, define, let's say, location of the wheel like here. And then it's going to apply the moving load, I mean the um, axial force and the moment about that reference line. But when you actually choose the cross beam type, what's going to happen is this is more of a natural way. So. It's going to use the cross beams to actually distribute the force to the girders. But if you go with the lane element type, it's going to apply those with the eccentricity about the reference um, um, lines. And lane element isn't really recommended um, unless it's a single girder um, type. And cross beam is the type you want to go with for any multi-line girder um, structure. So here I choose cross beam type and select the cross beam group as the dummy deck. Uh, so dummy deck is this transverse um, elements without any weight, but just the stiffness in order to um, in order to um, uh, reflect the um, concrete stiffness in the transverse direction. And here we go. Yep. And one more detail. If you want to reflect the dual truck rule according to Ashto, you need to specify the location of the span.
So right now our element is, uh, one second. So this is our um, uh, reference line, right? Reference line for the, uh, for the lane. And we have to let the program know which location is the start of the span. So that way the program can consider, um, it can consider the dual truck rule. I mean, know exactly where is the support located. It's an FBA program, so it needs a little more additional information like that. So check on element um, 45, element 49. Moving on, test the um, temporary support here, 97. and so on. So this way, let the program know which location exactly is the support location so that uh, the dual truck role can be considered fully. And when you review your moving load analysis, uh, you can actually review the envelope result too. So when you go to uh, results, force result diagram, you can review with the bending diagram format or even stress, whatever the case be, you see all the combination here. See the moving load. Find the moving load defined. And all means it's an envelope case. And if you go with MV max, it's to review just the positive moment. MV min, so min max, all, all is the envelope. Min is just the minimum, like the negative values, maximum negative value. And all will be the envelope of all. And this is the envelope result. But if you're looking more for uh, the, the forces, the concurrent forces, so this is a normal force. These are actually the values um, that's the maximum, the worst case um, at every location. But if you're more interested in knowing the concurrent forces, find the, um, the, the location of your interest element. It's according to the legend. It's telling me the element 83 is where the maximum positive moment occurs. So 83, keep in mind, and element 50 is where the maximum negative moment occurs. So looking at your envelope um, diagram and the legend summary, you actually get to know uh, at which location you want to extract the concurrent force for, from. I mean, it wouldn't really make sense to extract um, like a concurrent force when this member is undergoing the max, worst case scenario, right? You want to extract the concurrent force uh, for the worst cases. So keep that in mind, element 83. Go to moving load tracer, find beam force moment and 83, and say OK. So this way, you can find out exact location of the vehicle and the lane load when element 83 was undergoing the maximum moment. Okay. And regardless, if you're if you're wondering about, you know, like concurrent forces, when reaction was the worst, you know, you can find them all. Go to moving load tracer, find reaction displacement, trust force, beam force moment. And for the beam force moment, you can not only do that for uh, the bending moment, you can also do it for shear. But most likely, we are interested in taking uh, the moment and also for the reaction. So about different case of concurrent forces, you can use a moving load tracer like this. And find out at when specific location is undergoing the maximum force, what is the scenario with the vehicle loading? Let's say over here, what is the where is the vehicle located with this is undergoing the maximum bending moment? So those type of information can be extracted using uh, this uh, moving load tracer. Okay. And um, one last portion um, will be approximate tendon loss. So. If you actually run the analysis like this, I didn't cover too much of the pre-stress um, the results, but then basically any type of pre-stress or creep shrinkage data, 
You can review in the diagram format or you can review in the table format too. Remember force, bending diagram here. This is the same um, location you came to extract the result about dead load or just regular construction load, right? But when you come to here, you're going to see the construction stage loadings are categorized into dead load, tendon primary, secondary, creep shrink secondary, shrinkage secondary, and summation, summation of all, creep primary, shrinkage primary, one by one. And this type of um, um, segmentation, the program does it automatically. So the you know tendon the tendon loading, it's the program can obviously know which one's the tendon data. Creep, it's calculated based on the material and the surrounding component, not exactly the loading. The program knows and extracts uh, creep and shrinkage secondary primary um, result at different category. So this is something that the program does automatically for a construction stage. And if you want to break down the dead load, you can actually go to analysis and go to construction stage for that and segment your dead load. Right now, anything that's not a part of tendon creep or shrinkage goes to the dead load. Okay. And I have a question come in regarding the moving load portion, but I'll get to it in a little later. Uh, so basically, the tendon um, pre-stress result two you can review um, just the same way you review for the regular force and so on. And if you're looking for more of a, a tendon specific results, uh, tendon location coordinate at different stage, meaning how is it uh, moving, getting sleep, and tendon elongation um, arrangement, or tendon loss, or tendon assignment loss, this type of um, the stress related data can be found from um, this tendon specific result tables and as you can see from the top these are the type of uh, results that you can get all the detail on um, the um, stress and the loss results at different stage about each cord each tendon line and so on all that in stage one it's not activated so the values are zero Okay. And how do you know, let's say, how do you know, like, what, where is this occurring? You say it's element 55i, like, where is this? You go to the model view, uh, use the window here, type in 53. It's going to highlight it. And also go to query, go to query node or element. Find where exactly that location is located or if you want to go extract the mass data, you can go to the work tree, actually get to the table of the element or the node. So this way you get to know the exact coordinate location of the node and element. So the result will be presented about the node and element, right? So about each node and element, you get to know exact coordinate 